so vast, oh so mighty, the great river rolls to sea. Flowers do waves thrash, heroes do sands smash. When all the dreams drain, same are loss and gain. Green mountains remain under pink sunsets. Hoary fishers and woodcutters along the banks find calm water. In autumn moon or in spring wind, by the wine jars fill porcelain. Discuss and talk and tail, only laugh and gale. The world under heaven, after a long period of division, tends to unite. After a long period of union, tends to divide. This has been so since antiquity. When the rule of the Zhou dynasty weakened, seven contending kingdoms sprang up, warring with one another, until the kingdom of Qin prevailed and possessed the empire. But when Qin's destiny had been fulfilled, two opposing kingdoms arose, Zhou and Han, to fight for the mastery, and Han was the victor. The rise of the fortunes of Han began when Liu Bang, the supreme ancestor, slew a white serpent to raise the banners of uprising, which only ended when the whole empire belonged to Han. This magnificent heritage was handed down in successive Han emperors for two hundred years till the rebellion of Wang Mang caused the disruption. But soon, Liu Shu, the latter Han emperor, restored the empire and Han emperors continued their rule for another two hundred years to the days of Emperor Xian, which were doomed to see the beginning of the empire's division into three parts, known to history as the Three Kingdoms. But the descent into misrule hastened in the reigns of the two predecessors of Emperor Xian, Emperor Huan and Ling, who sat in the dragon throne about the middle of the second century. Emperor Huan paid no heed to the good people of his court, but gave his confidence to the palace eunuchs. He lived and died, leaving the scepter to Emperor Ling, whose advisers were Regent Marshal Dou Wu and Imperial Guardian Chen Fan. Dou Wu and Chen Fan, disgusted with the abuses of the eunuchs in the affairs of the state, plotted the destruction for the power-abusing eunuchs. But chief eunuch Cao Zi was not to be disposed of easily. The plot leaked out, and the honest Dou Wu and Chen Fan were put to death, leaving the eunuchs stronger than before. It fell upon the day of the full moon of the fourth month of the second year in the era of established calm that Emperor Ling went in state to the Hall of Virtue. As he drew near the throne, a rushing whirlwind arose in the corner of the hall, and lo, from the roof beams flowed down a monstrous black serpent that coiled itself upon the very seat of majesty. The emperor fell in a swoon. Those nearest him hastily raised and bore him to his palace, while the courtiers scattered and fled. The serpent disappeared. But there followed a terrific tempest. Thunder, hail, and torrents of rain, lasting till midnight and working havoc on all sides. Two years later, the earth quaked in capital Luoyang, while along the coast a huge tidal wave rushed, in which in its recoil swept away all the dwellers of the sea. Another evil omen was recorded ten years later, when the ring title was changed to Radiant Harmony. Certain hens suddenly crowed. At the new moon of the sixth month, a long wreath of murky clouds wound its way into the Hall of Virtue, while in the following month a rainbow was seen in the dragon chamber. Away from the capital, a part of the Yuan Mountains collapsed, leaving a mighty rift in the flank. Such were some of the various omens. Emperor Ling, greatly moved by the signs of the displeasure of heaven, issued an edict asking his ministers for an explanation of the calamities and marvels. Court Counselor Tsai Yong replied bluntly, Falling rainbows and changes of foul sexes are brought about by the interference of empresses and eunuchs in state affairs. The emperor read this memorial with deep sighs, and chief eunuch Tsao Tzu, from his place behind the throne, anxiously noted these signs of grief. 
an opportunity offering, Zhao Zhe informed his fellows, and a charge was trumped up against Zai Yuan, who was driven from the court and forced to retire to his country house. With this victory, the eunuchs grew bolder. Ten of them, rivals in wickedness and associates in evil deeds, formed a powerful party known as the Ten Regular Attendants. Zheng Zhang, Zhao Zhong, Chen Quan, Duang Gui, Feng Shu, Guo Sheng, Hou Lan, Jian Shuo, Zhao Zhe, and Xia Yun. One of them, Zheng Zhang, won such influence that he became the emperor's most honored and trusted advisor. The emperor even called him Foster Father. So the corrupt state administration went quickly from bad to worse, till the country was ripe for rebellion and buzzed with brigandage. At this time, in the county of Sulu was a certain Zhang family, of whom three brothers bore the name of Zhang Jiao, Zhang Ba, and Zhang Lian. Respectively, the eldest, Zhang Jiao, was an unclassed graduate who devoted himself to medicine. One day, while culling simples in the woods, Zhang Jiao met a venerable old gentleman with very bright emerald eyes and fresh complexion, who walked with an oak wood staff. The old man beckoned Zhang Jiao into a cave, and there gave him three volumes of the Book of Heaven. This book, said the old gentleman, is the essential arts of peace. With the aid of these volumes, you can convert the world and rescue humankind. But you must be single-minded, or rest assured, you will greatly suffer. In the first month of the first year of central stability, there was a terrible pestilence that ran throughout the land, whereupon Zheng Jiao distributed charmed remedies to the afflicted. The godly medicines brought big successes, and soon he gained the title of wise and worthy master. He began to have a following of disciples whom he initiated into the mysteries and sent abroad throughout all the land. They, like their master, could write charms and recite formulas, and their fame increased his following. Zheng Jiao began to organize his disciples. He established 36 circuits, the larger with 10,000 or more members, the smaller with about half that number. Each circuit had its chief, who took the military title of general. They talked wildly of the death of the Blue Heaven, and setting up of the Golden One. They said a new cycle was beginning, and would bring universal good fortune to all members, and they persuaded people to chalk the symbols for the first year of the new cycle on the main doors of their dwelling. With the growth of the number of his supporters grew also the ambition of Zhang Jiao, the wise and worthy master dreamed of empire. One of his partisans, Ma Yuanyi, was sent bearing gifts to gain the support of the eunuchs within the palace. To his brothers, Zhang Jiao said, Or oh, schemes like ours always the most difficult art is to gain the popular favor, but that is already ours. Such an opportunity must not pass. And they began to prepare. Many yellow flags and banners were made, and a day was chosen for the uprising. Then, Zhang Jiao wrote letters to Feng Shi and sent them by one of his followers, Tang Zhou, who, alas, betrayed his trust and reported the plot to the court. The emperor summoned the trusty regent marshal, He Cin, and bade him look to the issue. Ma Yuanyi was at once taken and beheaded. Feng Shi and many others were cast into prison. The plot having thus become known, the Zhang brothers were forced at once to take the field. They took up grandiose titles, Zhang Jiao, the Lord of Heaven, Zhang Ba, the Lord of Earth, and Zhang Lian, the Lord of Human. And in these names, they put forth this manifesto. The good fortune of the Han is exhausted, and the wise and worthy man has appeared. Discern the will of heaven, O ye people, and walk in the way of righteousness, whereby alone ye may attain to peace. Support was not lacking. 
On every side, people bound their heads with yellow scarves and joined the army of the rebel Zhang Jiao, so that soon his strength was nearly half a million strong, and the official troops melted away at a whisper of his coming. Regent Marshal and Imperial Guardian He Tsun memorialized for general preparations against the yellow turbans, and an edict called upon everyone to fight against the rebels. In the meantime, three Imperial commanders, Lu Zhi, Huang Fu Song, and Zhu Tun marched against them in three directions with veteran soldiers. Meanwhile, Zheng Jiao led his army into You Zhou, the northeastern region of the empire. The imperial protector of You Zhou was Liu Yan, a scion of the imperial house. Learning of the approach of the rebels, Liu Yan called in commander Zhou Qing to consult over the position. Zhou Qing said, There are many and we are few. We must enlist more troops to oppose them. Liu Yan agreed, and he put out notices calling for volunteers to serve against the rebels. One of these notices was posted up in the county of Zhuo, where lived one man of high spirit. This man was no mere bookish scholar, nor found he any pleasure in study. But he was liberal and amiable, albeit a man of few words, hiding all feeling under a calm exterior. He had always cherished a yearning for high enterprise, and had cultivated the friendship of humans of mark. He was tall of stature, his ears were long, the lobes touching his shoulders, and his hands hung down below his knees. His eyes were very big and prominent, so he could see backwards past his ears. His complexion was as clear as jade, and he had rich red lips. He was a descendant of Prince Sheng of Zhongsheng, whose father was the Emperor Qing, the fourth emperor of the Han dynasty. His name was Liu Bei. Many years before, one of his forebears had been the governor of that very country. However, he had lost his rank for remissness in ceremonial offerings. That branch of the family had remained on in the place, gradually becoming poorer and poorer as the years rolled on. His father, Liu Hong, had been a scholar and a virtuous official, but died young. The widow and orphan were left alone, and Liu Bei, as a lad, won a reputation for filial piety. At this time, the family had sunk deep in poverty, and Liu Bei gained his living by selling straw sandals and weaving grass mats. The family home was in a village near the chief city of Zhuo. Near the house stood a huge mulberry tree, and seen from afar, its curved profile resembled the canopy of a wagon. Noting the luxuriance of its foliage, a soothsayer had predicated that one day a man of distinction would come forth from the family. As a child, Liu Bei played with the other village children beneath this tree, and he would climb up into it, saying, I am the son of heaven, and this is my chariot. His uncle, Liu Yuan Qi, recognized that Liu Bei was no ordinary boy, and saw to it that the family did not come to actual want. When Liu Bei was fifteen, his mother sent him traveling for his education. For a time, he served Zheng Xuan and Lu Zhi as masters, and he became great friends with Gun Sun Zan. Liu Bei was twenty-eight when the outbreak of the yellow turbans called for soldiers. The sight of the notice saddened him, and he sighed as he read it. Suddenly, a rasping voice behind him cried, Sir, why sigh if you do nothing to help your country? Turning quickly, he saw standing there a man about his own height, with a bullet head like a leopard's, large eyes, a swallow-pointed chin, and whiskers like a tiger's. He spoke in a loud bass voice. It looked as irresistible as a dashing horse. At once, Liu Bei saw he was no ordinary man, and asked who he was. Zhang Fei is my name. 